Christ. A few years ago, I gave a, uh, a lecture to, to my campus. We have what's known as a 310 class. It's called Understandings of Christianity. The purpose of that class is to teach students about how the Judeo-Christian tradition influenced the Western world. Right? Because the argument is, if you're going to know something about uh, the West or European history, you have to know the influence that Christianity had. Right? Because Christianity is at the foundation, presumably, of Western civilization. At the same time, in doing that, you also find out that beginning with the Roman Catholic Church, because there were no Protestants until there was a Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church was actually not interested in advancing what we know as the natural sciences or the high sciences. The Roman Catholic Church during the medieval period, prior to the Moors, so we're talking about from the 4th century AD, the Roman Catholic Church said you were educated if you could read Latin and of course write it, if you were familiar with the biography of the saints, and if you could conduct mass. There was no focus on incorporating anything of what was deemed as Greek knowledge, because as you probably know, so much uh, usually uh, that comes from Western scholars is this idea that the intellectual tradition begins with the Greeks, right? So we talk about the Greco-Roman world, Greeks and Romans. The fact of the matter is the Greeks borrowed or stole, depending upon your perspective, much of their foundation in what we recognize as the sciences from ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. That's right. The Romans then took from the Greeks primarily, but the foundations of it are still coming out of Nile Valley civilization. A sidebar. When I first started studying more science, now mind you, I'm studying this as a historian, but I was intrigued that this organization that our prophet and founder, Noble Drawley, set up had us beginning, to a large extent, with Egypt. That, to me, was no coincidence. It implied that there was something there. The fact that no other organization and certainly not mainstream, you know, Sunni Islam, puts any focus on understanding Egypt and its role, was also something to go, wait a minute, let me take another look at what's going on over here. This community, these folks are emphasizing nationality, but they're also emphasizing knowing our history, know thyself, which is rooted in ancient Kemet. And yet we're then moving into the era of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all the prophets, which is then telling us that this period, known as the Middle Ages, or the medieval period, is the period when the Moors invade Europe, first and foremost Spain, what, well there wasn't no Spain, but the Iberian Peninsula becomes Spain and Portugal goes up into areas of southern France, controls portions of Sicily and portions of Crete, and even goes into areas of Eastern Europe. This legacy is known in European history, but yet it's not talked about. And by the time I finish, I hope you understand why. I gave myself, I, I, well, next time I'll bring a projector. Uh, next time I'll bring a projector because some, the power of some of the imagery, too, speaks volumes in terms of what exists in art history. But I also outlined some things that just help me keep on point. First, if we look at this era then of the Moorish presence in Europe, I refer to it as a period of enmity and harmony. Enmity meaning conflict, 
harmony, meaning periods where folks are working together. Centuries of intermarriage, centuries of exchange of cultures. Most of the exchange in terms of the high sciences is coming from the East and going into the West. Right? For the reasons I just explained. Something else, there's also generally greater camaraderie among the rank and file, the working class folks. Those in positions of power tended not to want to see the average man or woman, be they Moorish or be they European, working together and trying to create a harmonious environment. You might know the reasons behind that if you understand how power would have worked in that period, right? You want as much divide and conquer as possible. And the Moors especially were known for being incredibly respectful and tolerant. Something that you've probably heard before, the Arabic phrase, al al-kitab, which means the people of the book. What guided how the Moors interpreted other faiths, specifically all the faiths that came out of the Abrahamic tradition, was that you're of the book if you're a Christian because you believe in the teachings of Jesus. You're of the book if you're Jewish because you believe in the teachings of Abraham, Moses, and the prophets. So for the Muslim population, their view was, I always have respect for you if you believe truly in the teachings of Jesus, because this is all a continuation of the same law, the same spiritual law. The problem was that attitude didn't exist at the time with the Roman Catholic Church, because the Roman Catholic Church said, I can't acknowledge you. You're following this Arab prophet Muhammad. We don't acknowledge Muhammad. The Jewish community, for the most part, said the same thing. They didn't recognize Muhammad as a prophet. So as a result, this love was going, to a large extent, in one direction, or this respect was going in one direction. The Moors were, were inclined to encourage more harmony because of that. And again, I take it as no accident that so much of what we emphasize when we talk about the five if you will, basic or essential principles that make up a law. The father of love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. Love comes first. Because if you don't have that, how can you facilitate the other attributes? That's what Christians, when they follow the best of Christianity, are also supposed to be doing, right? Service to man, woman, service to humanity in love. <clears throat> the Moors create this environment in, in Al-Andalus in a way that allows for greater respect and exchange of ideas.